church family. I'm Abby. And I'm Dave. And we're here to let you know what's going on in FPC. Our family business meeting is tonight at 5.30 p.m. in the Worship Center. Book reports are available in the lobbies. And guys, don't forget the next men's prayer breakfast is on Saturday, February the 5th at 7 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. We hope you come hungry because there will be a lot of food and a great devotional time. We are so excited about Baptism Sunday on February 6th. If you're ready to take that next step, you can email info at fbcbolivar.org, call the church office, or talk to a member of our ministry staff. Also, today we have core group signups. Don't do life alone. Sign up for a core group today if you haven't already. Core group booklets with more information are at each of the info hubs in the lobby. Our second grade Sunday school class is still collecting canned soup for our annual Super Bowl soup drive. You can donate soup cans yourself or donate money so we purchase cans for you. The deadline to donate will be on Super Bowl Sunday, February 13th. Our goal for this year is, you guessed it, 2,022 cans. Awesome. And college students, we're so glad that you're back and that you're here today. I hope you'll join us tonight for College Supper at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall and this Wednesday at 8.30 for the collective in the Esquire. Church family, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at First Baptist Bolivar or visit our website, fbcbolivar.org for more information. We hope you have a great Sunday. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad you're here today. We want to welcome those who are watching online or listening on the radio as well. If this is one of your first times worshiping with us, we want to point you to text the word guest to the number on the screen, 417-282-8322. If you do that, it helps us connect with you. Or there are info hub tables in our lobbies. After the service, there would be someone at that table who would love to meet you and help you get connected with First Baptist. It's a great day to be in worship today. We're thankful to have SBU President Dr. Rick Melson here to bring our message today. And we are going to start with Psalm 95, verses 1 through 6. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let's stand today and sing praises to our God.
314, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Verses 1 through 9. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not understand. 
but do not perceive. Let's continue our worship by singing together, Behold Our God. Yeah. 
Let's stand together one more time as we sing in Christ alone.
Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Rick Melson. I have the privilege of serving as the president at Southwest Baptist University, and I bring you greetings from SBU. It's a delight to see you. Thank you to uh, Brett and choir and orchestra for leading us today, leading us to the throne of grace where we can gather together and worship together. I'm so grateful for each of you and for the partnership that we have with First Baptist Church Bolivar, a longstanding partnership. SBU's been in Bolivar for 143 years, and we've partnered, and of course, you've been here longer than 143 years uh, together as a, as a church, and uh, together, I appreciate your investment. I see many uh, faculty and staff and students who are in the room here and saw in previous services as well. We appreciate the partnership and appreciate the work that we do together. Well, this morning we're going to look at worship, our response to God's greatness. And uh, earlier in the service, uh, Brett read our text for today, which comes from Isaiah chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to take your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is in the middle of your Bible after uh, Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And you'll get to Isaiah and uh, Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, it's Isaiah's vision of the Lord. Uh, as you heard him reading that, uh, you are probably, like many of us, uh, very familiar with that text. Isaiah chapter 6 ends with the famous words, here am I, send me. In fact, probably most of us in this room have heard that preached before at a missions conference or an evangelism conference. A call to go, a call to serve, a call to respond. Here am I, send me. There are songs written about it. We are familiar with the text. But most of the time when we think about this text, and those words in particular, we don't think of this primarily as a worship text. We think it primarily as a missions text. And it is. It is indeed. Isaiah is called. Isaiah responds. And it's an appropriate usage of the text. But this morning, I want us to look at this text in a different frame, a different lens, so to speak, a different facet of the text. To see the dialogue that's happening between God's revelation and Isaiah's response. God reveals himself and Isaiah responds. God reveals himself and Isaiah responds. God reveals himself in his power and his presence. Isaiah responds in confession and repentance. We see the heavenly beings that gather together and they cry out to one another antiphonally, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and the whole earth is filled with his glory. And then we see the wonderful atonement that takes place as confession and repentance in Isaiah's life takes place there before the Lord God Almighty. And he confesses his sin. He says, woe is me for I am undone. I am unclean. I am a man and my, my, my lips are unclean and I live in a land where the people's lips are unclean. And then the, the seraphim, the heavenly being, takes a coal and he brings it over and he touches Isaiah's lips and he says, your sins have been atoned for. Then it says, and then I heard the voice of the Lord. Then I heard the voice of the Lord. The Lord spoke. The Lord said, who will go for us? And Isaiah responds, here am I, send me. Do you see the dialogue that's taking place there in the, in the text? Isaiah responds to a holy God. Now as you look at this text, if your Bibles are open there, I invite you to look and see the very first word in the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died. And this is an important framework because what I want us to talk about is true worship, worshiping a right God in a right way. In fact, uh, a text that I often refer to or a definition that I often refer to in worship is from a professor that I had in, in 2000. In the 1990s, I went to Southern Seminary, Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. I studied there. In 2000, uh, my family and I were traveling, serving in churches. I was in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and had the opportunity to do some postgraduate studies at Southwestern Seminary. And when I was there, I had a professor by the name of Bruce Leafblad. And Dr. Leafblad said this, and he put it on the screen. I'm going to read it. He says, worship is communion with God in which believers, by grace, center their mind's attention and heart's affections on the Lord, humbly glorifying God in response to his greatness and his word. So this morning, we're going to talk about true worship, responding to a almighty, holy God. Otherwise, worshiping the right God 
in the right way. Dr. Leif Blad says that worship is communion with God. It's communication with God. God reveals himself, we respond. God reveals himself through his word, and we respond. God reveals himself in his presence, and we respond. Worshiping the right way, the right God, in the right way. He also says that worship is for true believers. We have to be believers to enter the presence of God. By grace, it allows us to center our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the Lord, humbly glorifying God. See, our response, as Dr. Leifblad said, is humble adoration before a holy God. To glorify God in response to his greatness, in response to his word. And that's what we see here in this dialogue that's taking place between Isaiah and a holy God. When we, when we look at the text, we see this magnificent thing happening as God reveals himself. But the first three words in the year that King Uzziah died, the first few words remind us that there's a time and a place that this took place. This is a date stamp, so to speak, to let us know that this is the year that King Uzziah died. But I believe more than just a time and a date stamp here, God is telling us something significant about the framework of worship. See, it'd be very easy to just gloss over those words in the, king, the year that King Uzziah died, and probably most of the times we do. We get to chapter six, we simply read, in the year that King Uzziah died. Well, who is Uzziah? If this afternoon, probably after the Chiefs game, if you want to read through Second Chronicles chapter 26, you'll get an entire picture and portrait of the king who was king at the time. We know that King Uzziah was 16 years old when he became the king of Judah. He reigned for 52 years until his death. He died around 740 BC. So we can can date this experience with Isaiah around 2750 years ago. If you recall, this is the time when when Israel is divided into two kingdoms. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And Uzziah is king over the southern kingdom part of the kingdom, Judah. And in Judah is Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the holy hill. It's where the Jews, the Israelites, gather together to worship. It's where they found an almighty God. It says that it was a prosperous time in the life of Israel. It was a wonderful time. They had great success. The king had great success. Everything he did was prosperous. It says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to what his father had done. He was successful in battle. He was successful in building his territory, building cities, building towers in Jerusalem. He increased the size of his army to 300,000 men. He prepared them with army shields and spears and helmets. He won battles and he was very strong. And this afternoon as you're reading, you'll get to verse 16. And it says, but when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. When he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord God. And this is what happened. He decided that he would go into the temple to burn incense. And if you remember, the role and responsibility of the one to burn incense was the chief of the uh, priests. The priest would go into the Holy of Holies. If you remember the most sacred space where God's presence and power existed, the priest would go in. But the king decided he would go into the Holy of Holies. See, King Uzziah understood the right God. What he missed was the right way. And God had given plenty of instruction on the right way in how to worship at the temple. And Uzziah decided that he was going to go in and burn incense. Now the chief priest came to him and said, do not go into the Holy of Holies. That is not your place. That is not your role. That is not your right. And Uzziah became very angry. Azariah, the chief priest, actually brought 80 other priests to him to beg him not to go into the Holy of Holies. But Uzziah decided to go straight into the Holy of Holies and to burn incense. After 52 years of a successful reign As king, Uzziah entered those rooms all the way to the Holy of Holies, and as he was in the presence of God, God struck him with leprosy, 
And he spent the rest of his life separated from the house of God, separated from his people, and separated as king. And he died a leper. Now, my purpose for bringing that up isn't to suggest that each of us will die a leper, or that if we worship the right God in the wrong way, that we will be struck with the disease. But what I do want to say is there's a right way to worship the right God. And what Uzziah decided to do was to worship the right God in the wrong way. We call that vain worship. Vain worship. His pride, his heart, became so strong that it overtook his mind and he worshiped God, but in the wrong way. Jesus says it this way in Mark chapter 7. He's gathered together, and if you remember the passage there, the disciples are out on the Sabbath, and they're collecting grain, and they're just gathering up grain in their hands, and they're eating it on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, uh, well, Jesus, uh, we're concerned because your disciples are eating with unwashed hands. They're unclean before the Lord. And Jesus says to them, from Isaiah 29, a passage after Isaiah 6, he says this to the Pharisees. Well, didn't Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites? He said, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In worship, they worship me. In vain worship. In vain do they worship me. In vain do they worship me, Jesus says. In vain do they worship me. See, there's a right way to worship a right God. The Pharisees were so caught up in their rules and doing the right things that they forgot about the right way. As we think about worship, an important context has to be brought to our mind because the reality is we think of worship and we think of time and place. What is worship? Well, does it happen at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning? Yes. But does it happen in other times in our lives? Are there other places that we worship? Do we only worship here in church? Do we have to be in a special place? Is there a special time that we worship? All throughout scripture, there's more focus on who we worship and how we worship than where we worship. Even Jesus brings to light the importance of worshiping in spirit and in truth. There's a way that we can worship with our lips and not engaging with our heart. There's a way that we can know all the right things and say all the right things and do all the right things and not worship with our life. And that's the context. That's the framework that we move into this passage. See, it would have been so easy to just skip over Uzziah's life, but Uzziah provides a backdrop of vain worship for us to understand the portrait of true worship that Jesus gives us or that God gives us in Isaiah chapter 6. And I think it's so important that we understand this context, that we have that black velvet backdrop to see the beauty of what God demonstrates through Isaiah as true worship. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, verse 1, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, there's some other piece that I want us to catch here. The king died. The people loved this king. They were prosperous. But there's a reminder that Isaiah makes immediately. It was the year that King Uzziah died, but guess what? The king is still seated on the throne. See, God is sovereign in all of our setting and all of our circumstances. He's sovereign in our life. Even though the earthly king had died, the Lord God Almighty was still seated on the throne. He was high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah reminds us that his presence and his power was there. It says that smoke filled the room. The Holy Spirit was there. His power and his presence were there. The doorposts, thresholds shook at the presence of God. And there Jesus is seated right on the throne. It's a pre-incarnate vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I know that? He says, who will go for us? Plural. It's the Trinity. It's God's power and presence of Father. His His Son, seated on the throne, in the presence 
of the Holy Spirit in that place. And above him stood the seraphim. The seraphim were created beings. They are God's created beings. And there, they are speaking to one another antiphonally. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It says they had six wings. With two, they humbly covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And together in antiphonal praise, they cried out to one another, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, is the Lord God Almighty, and the whole earth is full of his glory, and the whole earth is filled of his glory. And over and over for eternity, they are singing the same song. How do I know that? You're familiar with the text from Revelation chapter 4? Revelation chapter 4 is a portrait into future worship. Do you remember? John on the island of Patmos is having a vision of future worship. And in Revelation chapter 4, what does he say? He says, there's Jesus seated on the throne. And here are the elders all around him. And the elders and all the people and all the heavenly beings are doing what? They're singing to him, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And the whole earth is filled with his glory. So if Jesus is seated on his throne in 2750 years ago, 750 BC at the time of Isaiah, and he's seated on his throne in future worship, then I believe today that Jesus is seated on the throne, that the heavenly beings and all there who are worshiping are gathered around the throne, crying out to one another in antiphonal praise, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come and the whole earth is filled with his glory for eternity. What a beautiful picture and beautiful portrait. One of the reasons I believe that worship is the main theme of this text, John Piper says that missions exist because worship doesn't. What he means by that is we will have missions in evangelism here on this earth until the end of this earth, but worship, it lasts for eternity. We will worship together for eternity, which means the ultimate goal of this text and the ultimate goal of our life is to glorify God and worship him and enjoy him for eternity. Is missions important? Absolutely. Is evangelism important? Absolutely. But they are penultimate to the ultimate of worship. We have missions in evangelism so that those who do not know him can come together to worship him. That's what we do. That's who we are as the church. We gather together in the church. We worship. We worship in our lives by serving and telling and showing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we bring others to him so that they also might worship him for eternity. What a blessed hope. What a blessed reminder for each of us this day. What a glorious truth as we worship together. But something significant happens in this text. If you have your Bible open, look at verse 5. In this glorious and beautiful worship service, Isaiah sees a holy God. He encounters a holy God. And in the presence of God, Isaiah recognizes himself. He sees himself for who he really is. And this is what he says. Woe is me, for I am lost. Your version might say, woe is me, for I am undone. Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Notice that Isaiah's immediate response isn't, I've got this. His immediate response is confession and repentance. He literally falls down prostrate before the Lord. The Hebrew word there, shakah, means to bow down in the presence of God. In the New Testament, we see the word proskuneo, to fall prostrate. When it says, and they fell down and worshiped him, Isaiah has fallen down before the Lord, shakah before the Lord to worship him. He recognizes the all-powerful, almighty God in his presence, and he sees his own lostness before him. But here's the good news. 
God doesn't leave him there. In his confession and in his repentance, God does something supernatural. He cleanses him from his unrighteousness. Only God can do that work. And God loves Isaiah and God loves you and God loves me enough to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness, for all of the wrong things that we've done, for all of the bad things that we've done. God gives us a privilege and a joy of coming to him to confess our sins. And what does he say? 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So now a holy God comes to Isaiah, he touches his lips with a coal, his sins are atoned for. It's a portrait and a picture of what takes place on the cross, where Jesus dies on our behalf for our sins, so that our sins can be paid for and atoned for. So then when we come before a holy God, and we confess that we are unworthy before him, and we confess and repent, and he cleanses us of all unrighteousness, we can be prepared and equipped and ready to be sent. Ready to be used by a holy God. So don't fear God from the sense of being afraid of God. Fear God for his holiness and his worthiness. And do not be afraid, for he has the gift of forgiveness. He forgives us when we are before him and we confess and repent and And here's the important thing. Our sins are atoned for. And then verse 8, a transitional verse. It says, and then I heard the voice of the Lord. The Lord has not spoken to this point. The heavenly beings are speaking on his behalf. That he is holy. He is almighty. The Lord God almighty. But now the Lord speaks. And Isaiah can hear because he's in a posture of humble adoration before a king. In confession and repentance, his sins have been forgiven, and now he hears the voice of the Lord. And the Lord says to him, who shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, Lord, send me. When we worship the right God, in the right way, we enter the presence of God. We enjoy his revelation to us. And when we respond in adoration and confession and repentance, we hear from the Lord. He speaks to us and he calls us. None of that's about time or place. All of that's about worshiping the right God in the right way. The second point I want to make is that true worship is worshiping in spirit and in truth. In John chapter 4, there's a very familiar passage that most of you know. It's the story of of Jesus meeting up with the woman at the well. It's the, the story of the Samaritan woman. And most of us know this story, and most of us would recount this story and be reminded that a woman came to a well, and she found living water, and her life was transformed and changed forever. And that's absolutely true. But there's a dialogue that takes place in the middle of that encounter that is very significant. First of all, this wasn't happenstance. The woman didn't just happen to meet Jesus at the well. Jesus planned for an ordained moment to meet with the woman at the well. See, Jews and Samaritans hated one another. It would be very customary that the Jews would have gone around Samaria, and Jesus says, we're going to go right through Samaria. He goes straight to the well. He sends his disciples out for something to eat. And he waits there by himself. And here comes the woman. And she comes to him. She's a little surprised she's there. They start a dialogue. And in that dialogue, he asks her to bring her husband. And she says, I'm I'm not married. And Jesus says to her, I know you're not married. You've been married five times. And you're currently living with a man who's not your husband. In that awkward confrontation... She changes the subject. And you know what the topic is that she changes the subject to? Worship. She's confronted by her own sin, and before a holy God, she has no idea this is Jesus. She changes the subject, but she does recognize that he's a prophet. She Obviously, he knew a lot about her. 
He was a teacher, a rabbi, and she said, I have a question for you. Our people worship over on that hill, and your people worship over on that hill. So he obviously recognized her. She recognized him as a prophet, as a Jew. And Jesus' response is really important because he doesn't actually answer her question. She asked, which is the holy hill? Where am I supposed to go to worship? Where is the time and the place that I worship? And he doesn't answer that question at all. What does he say? He says, true worshipers will worship the the Father in spirit and in truth. Did you catch that? It has nothing to do with time and place. It has everything to do with who and how. True worshipers will worship the Father who in spirit and in truth, how? Jesus is saying worship is way more about head and heart than it is about time and place. That when we worship a holy God, it's about worshiping in spirit and in truth. It's important to know and understand that spirit is not capitalized here. Sometimes we see this text and we think that we should worship in the Holy Spirit and in truth, that God is truth. But what Jesus is saying here in the Hebrew understanding in the Greek word is the idea of spirit of our who we are, our being, that we are to worship with all that we are and in truth, otherwise head and heart. Remember that worship definition I gave you? To center our mind's attention and heart's affections on a holy God. It's about truth, our mind, knowing and understanding who God is. But it's not limited to that. It's also about the stirring of our affections, of our being toward him. It's also not just about stirring our affections and not knowing the truth about God. It's both and. Jesus is saying true worship isn't about which holy hill you go to or which service you go to. It's about whether or not you worship in spirit and in truth. So true worship is worshiping the right God in the right way. Jesus says true worship is worshiping in spirit and in truth. And the last point I want to make is simply true worship is all of life. It's everything we do. It's everything we are. The Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, a very familiar passage to us, says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual service of worship. You catch that? Nothing about when and where to go, but it's about living out your life as your spiritual service of worship. He says, I appeal to you, give yourselves, it's yourselves to live out your life, to serve, to lead in your spiritual service of worship. See, for 11 chapters, Paul has been giving a theology. It ends at chapter 11 with a doxology, and now he says, go out and do, and this is how you do. You live out your life. You give of yourselves in your spiritual service of worship. That word worship there is the word latreo, and it literally means to serve and give of yourself. It's different than the one where we bow down and worship together. It's to give of yourself. What is Paul saying? Worship is all of life. It's everything that we do. Whether we eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. Everything we do is about worshiping God in every way that we live, in every way that we serve So true worship is a right response to a holy God. It's worshiping the right God in the right way. Jesus says it's also worshiping in spirit and in truth. And Paul says it's worshiping in all of life. So in closing, here's a question for all of us today. Is your heart more like Uzziah? Have you traded your God dependency for self-sufficiency? Have you become so strong and so powerful in all of your might and all of your ability and all of your gifts that when you approach the throne of grace, you're more like, I've got this? Or are you more like the humble servant Isaiah who in his own presence of God falls before his holy God in confession and repentance? and is equipped and prepared to serve? Or are you like the Samaritan woman 
Someone challenges you with your sin. Someone confronts you with your sin. You're reading God's word and he reveals your sin in your life and all you wanna do is change the subject. Or are you like Paul? Are you giving of yourself as a living sacrifice? Are you living out your life as your spiritual service of worship? God has called each of us today. He presents us with the opportunity to respond. And I pray that we will all respond with humble adoration before a holy God. That we will hear his voice and that he will equip us and he will send us out. That he will call each of us into the place of service. And that we will respond by giving of ourselves. Here am I, send me as our spiritual service of worship. And one day we will gather with the saints together and we will cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come and the whole earth is filled with his glory. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Lord, I do pray even this morning that you incline our hearts to yours. Help us to center our minds' attention and our hearts' affections on you. Help us to leave this place called, prepared to serve all of it for your glory and for our greatest joy, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let us join our voice and sing. Let's stand together for our song of response, hymn 68, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Amen. Thank you, Dr. Melson, for being here and sharing that word with us. We appreciate it. If you have any questions or if you'd like to talk to a pastor, maybe you're interested in learning more about following Jesus, being baptized, joining us at First Baptist, we would love to connect with you. If you would text the word CONNECT to the number on the screen, 417-282-8322, or I'll be here at the front. You're welcome to come down and talk to me in person. Also, there are many ways to continue worshiping through your giving. We have buckets at the worship center exits as you leave. You can also give by mail, text, bank draft, whatever works best for you. And today is the last day that we're having core group signups in the lobby. Once again, let me encourage you, if you're not actively involved in a core group, Mike Knight is out here at the table in the lobby and would love to connect with you and help you get connected to a small group for discipleship. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity to worship you. Thank you for this message and the truth of your word and how it pertains to our lives, Lord. Help us to leave here changed today, changed by your spirit. Help us to remember that worship doesn't matter in time and place. Worship is in spirit and in truth. Thank you for this word. Help us to hide it in our hearts, to focus it on today, and to spend so much time worshiping you, remembering that it is our purpose and it is eternal. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.